Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, August 15th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. <clears throat> we are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown brooklyn usa on the program today alufemi taiwo professor of philosophy at georgetown university author of elite capture how the powerful took over identity politics and everything else also on the program today turns out trump's warrant cited the Espionage Act. Imagine that. Meanwhile, Trump's lawyer had apparently previously certified that all classified documents that Donald Trump had walked out of the White House with had been returned. Define a... Uh... <laughs> and Trump loses his bid to toss a criminal tax case in Manhattan. Meanwhile, in Washington, the Democrats pass a build back a bit in the House, signing expected this week by Joe Biden. Abortion is now, as of Friday, totally illegal in Idaho, following a, a failed legal challenge same too in Louisiana as it keeps its abortion ban. The Arizona governor starts putting shipping containers on federal land to finish Donald Trump's wall. China announces new military drills as five members of the U.S. Congress visit Taiwan. And Brittany Griner appeals her conviction as talks of a prisoner swap continue all this and more on today's majority report welcome ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining us um emma vigland is out today and probably several days uh, going forward uh because she's got the vid she got covid last um, person to get covid in the office last person to get uh, covid in the office Felt left out, uh, wanted to join in all the fun. Um, I, ha I haven't spoken to her this morning, but uh, she's not super sick. No, don't th I think tired, but yeah, not not super. Uh... Yeah, not like Grandpa Sam got it. Yeah, uh, yeah but no. um, but uh, we will we will keep you abreast, and uh, uh, and hopefully we will uh, see her soon because I have a uh, planned vacation. My big vacation of the uh, the summer. Been a, been a it's been a tumultuous summer. Uh, you need it, Sam. <laughs> I'd say all my stuff is breaking all around me. Uh, I mean, all of it. Um, the software, software, computers, uh, social structures, uh, all of it. So, um, uh, yeah. Hopefully, I'll be able to <laughs> take that vacation. I think my. Uh, Kids and family. Uh, Bradley also has a vacation, so it might just be me hosting and producing the show entirely, <laughs> you know, like just me. This is going to be six hours of Matt doing video. The like stream. Streaming video <laughs> games. I mean, uh, playing American no, Truck exactly, Simulator. Exactly. Listen, all bets are off. If that's what it takes, man, that's what it takes. Um, let's get to this. There's been a lot more sort of, uh, I guess, meat put on the bones of the. Um, and now we know it wasn't a raid, per se, of Mar-a-Lago. It was a visit uh, where the lawyer was waiting for 
the uh, FBI. And it is also quite apparent, and I think there's been stories to the effect that somebody ratted out Donald Trump um, at Mar-a-Lago, maybe when they saw these boxes marked classified. And uh, we will get on to the uh, the the right wing talking points about this material being declassified because Trump uh, can just wave his wand and it's declassified even when he's not president anymore. We should say the reason why they're in boxes marked classified because they literally were. Because it's easy to move that way. Because when he moved him out of the White House. When he went down to Mar-a-Lago. Uh, they were classified. And when he left the White House, let's remember, folks, after January 20th of 2020, he was not president. You don't get to keep those special powers. But even if you did, none of the charges have to do with the, the fact that it's classified material. There are three separate charges that were, I should say, excuse me, not charges, citations in the warrant and it cited three different laws they were from title 18 of the united states uh, code section 793 which of course is the espionage act and it has to do with having uh defense related information that could harm the united states or uh, or an aid or foreign adversary it doesn't have to be classified just has to be a uh, material that meets that standard. Section 1519, which uh, covers destroying or concealing documents to obstruct an investigation by the government. And Section 2071, which covers the unlawful removal of government records. So those are the three um, laws cited in the warrant that doesn't mean that he's going to be charged with those or that he has been charged with those or anything else although it's conceivable but those are what the basis of the warrant were about journalist john solomon is, he, is that how he goes by independent journalist now is he no longer at the he, aie um, yeah no he he's doing like his thing called just the news now it's like his own venture oh, he's, he's own. no longer at the american enterprise institute i'll, I'll double check that but yeah. he's doing his own like yeah right wing uh, venture right wing hack uh, absolutely right wing hack. uh is reading out a statement from uh, donald trump's office um uh, on fox news and just the news the following statement i, I apologize for looking down but I have to, it's so fresh, it's on my phone. It literally just came in. This is from President Trump's office. Uh, it just came in a few minutes ago. As we can all relate to everyone, to, as, uh, as we can all relate to, everyone ends up having to bring home their work from time to time. American presidents are no different. President Trump, in order to prepare the work the next day, often took documents, including classified documents, to the residents. He had a standing order. There's the word I've been looking for that documents removed from the Oval Office and taken to the residence were deemed to be declassified the moment he removed them. The power to classify and declassify documents rests solely with the President of the United States. The idea that some paper-pushing bureaucrat with classification authority delegated by the President needs to approve the declassification is absurd. I asked around over the last couple of days. And um. So there it is. Um, it really doesn't address any of the things that were the elements that were in the uh, search warrant. Um, the idea that Donald Trump was working on these things mm. uh, is pretty hilarious. Working remotely. <laughs> He's like, you know, I was just working remote. Like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's conceivable to me that he had like he pulled out a Sharpie and started rewriting certain things. No. Um, no. <laughs> this is where the hurricane goes. Yes, exactly. And, um, but it's it's a joke. Yeah, imagine Hillary using that excuse. To like, yeah. I'm secretary. I'm I'm secretary of state. I don't need some low level bureaucrat. Anything I say is declassified. Is declassified. Exactly. Uh, just ridiculous. But uh, there it is. They are all uh, out there. Um, you know, uh, trying to uh, sort of backfill. And this is, and, and understand, this is really rear guard stuff. If they need to justify this on Fox News, 
This is rear guard stuff. There's nobody, I don't think there's anybody's, you know, certainly no Fox viewer is changing their mind about anything uh, regarding Donald Trump, in my estimation. Maybe, uh, you know, here and there. But for them to have to do this type of work uh, is, it means that they're, you know, very worried about going on and maintaining their own credibility. And really throwing stuff against the wall when you have people suggesting planting evidence and stuff like that. Like, that's not a, that's not a coherent story that they got, were able to get together. Well, yes, and they just got it undercut because Trump admitted it was there. And said, oh, no, we knew it was there. I brought it home. So it wasn't a question. I mean, it's weird because Trump initially in his initial statement was talking about planting evidence. And now he's saying, well, it's actually I I took it there on purpose. Obama did, too. To do work, to do work. Uh, But just to be clear, the um, the classification of this material even if you are to buy uh, Donald Trump's uh, excuse, is appears to be largely irrelevant. It is really uh, the nature of the documents. Um, and also, I mean, I don't know. I guess maybe they can parse out that lawyer's um, uh, certification that all classified material had been removed. Because if none of it was ever classified, then whatever you took was... Oh, yeah. I mean, because I have magical declassification fingers, but there you go. Uh, So we'll see. All right. We're going to take a uh, quick break. And when we come back, uh, we're not going to take that break yet. I'm going to read a couple of words of the sponsors. Uh, We'll be talking to uh, Lufemi uh, Taiwo, professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, author of Elite Capture, How the Powerful Took Over Identity Politics and Everything Else. But first, a couple of words from our sponsors. We have two uh, today. As you know, it's been incredibly hot in in most places throughout the country. Super important to keep hydrated. How do I do it? Well, one stick of liquid IV. Uh, I'm on a bit of a watermelon kick. I got stuck. I get stuck in ruts. Have you noticed that? Yeah, that's the same way I am with uh, liquid IV. I, I... for forever, I was drinking the matcha, the energy one, and that was great. And then just one day, I decided, you know what? Maybe I need some uh, immune protection, so I got the tangerine. And then I drank that like every day for months. And then I was like, well, I'm just gonna try the watermelon one day. And then I'm I've been watermelon ever since. So it's weird, but they have uh, ten different flavors. They have lemon lime, Concord grape. Actually, I had some Concord grape the other day, but that wasn't during the show. Uh, tropical punch, like I say, the matcha, the the watermelon. Liquid IV contains five essential vitamins: B three, B five, B six, B twelve, and vitamin C. And with Liquid IV, you get three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It is made with premium ingredients. It's non-GMO. It's free from gluten, dairy, and soy. And they use the science of cellular transport technology, and that's what makes Liquid IV so effective. It's designed to enhance rapid absorption of water and other key ingredients into the bloodstream. And Liquid IV is on a mission to change the world. The company's donated over 24 million servings globally. Uh, Honestly, this is, uh, I drink at least one of these a day, usually during the show. But if not, I finish it up afterwards. I stay completely hydrated. Uh, I feel the difference. I really do. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 15% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Use the code MAJORITYREP. That's MAJORITYREP at checkout. That's 15% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using the promo code MAJORITYREP at liquidiv.com. Also, uh, sponsored today, Aura. And you can get a free trial at Aura.com slash majority. Uh, that's Aura.com slash majority. What is Aura? Well, it addresses the fastest growing crime in America. And that is identity theft. It happens to one in 20 Americans. Literally every day, I feel like I get a letter from some company that I didn't know had my information 
that tells me that their, their, their stuff has been breached. I get it from my kids. I get it from myself. It, ha- it seems to happen all the time. And uh, then there's phishing things. That's how Day and I think got um, locked out of his Twitter account, but it can happen to anybody. You log into your email account one day, your password has been changed just several hours ago, and then you start getting notifications from your bank, from your credit cards, from your crypto accounts, whatever it is. And that's when you start to feel panic, you start to feel fear, anxiety, paranoia. The worst part is at the end, you start to feel frustration and and some form of uh, self-recrimination. You can avoid all of that because we're partnered with Aura, who is sponsoring this video. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all combined into one easy-to-use app. Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers and sends alerts fast right to your phone and to your email. When it comes to fraud, every second matters. You connect your credit card and bank accounts. You get notified of any changes up to four times faster than Aura's competitors. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. And their antivirus software will block malware and viruses before they infect your devices. I I logged in my email account and immediately it tells me that, and I have multiple emails I try out, but that uh, one of them had like three or four uh, password leaks. You know, I forgot that I signed up for whatever it was, dogs.com or whatever. I don't know what it was, but, uh, you know, there was a leak. There was a breach. And then you go in, you got to change your passwords. You got to change all of the passwords. Anyways, the uh, it was very quick. You can protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aura for free for two weeks. And see if any of you or your family's personal information has been compromised. Start your free trial at Aura.com slash majority. You head there now, and you can check that out. At least get see what's been leaked in the past as opposed to going forward. Uh, Aura.com slash majority. As always, links in the podcast and YouTube descriptions. Okay, I want to welcome, uh, oh, we need to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, Olufemi uh, Taiwo. We'll be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. I want to welcome to the program Olufemi uh, Taiwo. He is a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, author of his second book, Elite Capture, How the Powerful Took Over Identity Politics and Everything Else. Uh, Olufemi, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so let's start with, um, I guess, the, the, the bare basics. Um, what, what is identity politics? And I guess, you know, we can start, uh, or, or, you know, it started at the, uh, uh, at, at a, at the Kambaki, uh, uh, river collective, um, 50 some odd years ago, uh, or at least the idea was developed. Tell us how it was developed and what it's perceived to have mutated into, I guess. Yeah. So the basic idea um, as I understand it, um, as the Combe River Collective developed it, was identity politics is just doing politics starting from an understanding of your place in the social world, right? So you can start from the other direction. You can try to understand the whole social world, the whole social system, and do politics from there. But they thought it would be better to understand where you fit into things and then go from there. So whether 
you know, it's gender or race or, you know, whatever is salient to you. Um, that's a way that you can start thinking about what your political agendas and priorities are. And as they developed it, that was compatible with starting from there, but getting to working with other people and taking their concerns on board and so on and so forth. You know, all the things that we think of under the heading coalitional politics maybe today. Um, and what identity politics has morphed into for some people um, is something that's kind of anti-coalitional, anti-solidaristic. Like, I'm going to start thinking about where I fit in the social system and where people like me fit into the social system, and I'm going to end there. Like, that's who I'm fighting for. That's what the fight is about, you know, what people like me are going through, so on and so forth. Okay, so, and and let's talk about the 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 critiques of identity politics that exist today uh because they really do come from across the ideological spectrum uh but they are they're, they're different uh, based upon where those people are situated uh, right. on the spectrum um walk us through those different critiques and then uh let's talk about where yours fits in within that spectrum if it does yeah, I, I certainly think it, it fits in the spectrum. Um, I'd say on the far right, you know, you have an opposition to identity politics that is pretty, I, pretty nakedly, I think, just an investment in the way things are going, right? So people who pursue identity politics might want to change things on the basis of understanding the present system as patriarchal or anti-queer or anti-black or something like that. Um, and all those things are just fine to the people on the far right. Um, on the center right and the center, um, I think there's more of a willingness to entertain the idea that something might be wrong systemically with, something might be unfair systemically with how things go but um, they oppose the idea of doing politics from the perspective of any particular way in which the world is unfair, right? So we should have this kind of reflexive universalism. We should start by thinking, no, just, you know, what are the good rules for anybody and for everybody? And then, you know, there's a variety of, criticisms further left than that, I think one of the more interesting ones, um, and one of the ones I'm actually more sympathetic to, um, is the criticism from what you might call, just to caricature it, the class reductionist left, right? So you're talking about all these kinds of identities, um, all these kinds of oppression, racism, sexism, uh, queer phobia, all these things. Um, but really there's a particular kind of oppression that is more important that gets left out of the story of most of these other identity politics. And that is the kinds of oppression that is linked to capitalism as a system and or class identity as a way of being. Those aren't the exact same thing, but they're similar. Um, and so that's what we should focus on instead of identity politics. And, you know, I, I think mine is probably the closest to that last one. Um, but I think, you know, any, ver any way of thinking of capitalism worth having is going to notice um, that the thing that organizes our economic system is also the thing that organizes all of the other kinds of oppression. Um, and so that's why I think identity politics is still valuable, even if you thought that there was something particularly special about class or about capitalism as um, an aspect of how the world is put together. And, and so and just uh, and, and, and just going uh, back over uh, those in terms of the right, it, it seems to me that it really is just an argument of they don't have a problem with identity politics as much as they do with which identities are uh, maybe ascendant in our yeah. politics, right? I mean, like, it's, they've been 
the, the right has been practicing identity politics, it seems to me, since the founding of the country. It's just that it has been so overwhelming and it's been they've had such an exclusive uh, control over the terrain that nobody realized it. Or, or I should say, not nobody, obviously, uh, those people who have been marginalized and excluded. But it was never um, it was just that's just normal. That's just like oxygen, the fact that white identity politics would dominate. Um, and so it's really, it's not so much identity, but they, they couch it as if this is a new phenomenon. It's just really, yeah. there's different players on the field now, as it were. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, for much of the last few centuries, it's just been naked domination of, uh, some identity groups over others. You know, I'm older than the end of formal apartheid in South Africa, right? Um, you know, it was just a few decades before that that a lot of civil rights legislation passed for most of U.S. history, for most of the history of what we would now think of as the world, the last 500 years or so. Um, apartheid, you know, segregation, explicit formal privileges and rights for some particular kinds of people over others has just been, you know, oxygen, as you put it, right? It's just been the way that things went. Um, and I, I think there's not been a real change on the far right as far as thinking that that's, you know, um, not something to go for, right? That's still the way that they think the world should run. It's just now you're the moral etiquette of the day doesn't let you come out and say that. So you right. say a bunch of other things. And, and, and in terms of the center, like what are they, and I get as you, uh, as you describe it. And I think there is, uh, I attribute to them uh, maybe, maybe a little bit more good faith in their, but the, what are they ignoring when they um, say that we should just, I mean, it's almost as if they're saying, like, we should have a colorblind and a genderblind society is almost and anything else um, is, you know, almost like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, reverse discrimination on some level. Right. Like, what are they missing conceptually uh, in that assessment of what's going on? One of the big things that they're missing, um, aside from the obvious thing, which is just naivete about how that would actually go, right? You know, how how fairly will rules be applied, right? There's just a, a unwillingness to learn from policing and mass incarceration and all these kinds of things that clue us into what colorblindness means in practice. But I think even if you could get a system that would really genuinely apply rules in a quote unquote colorblind and fair way. I think a big thing that is missing from the centrist picture is just what the accumulated weight of the last 500 years means. Right? You know, it, it's the, you know, it, some people are starting essentially with a 400 year head start in terms of the kinds of cultural networks they have access to, the kinds of money they have access to, the kinds of, um, knowledge that has circulated among other people about how to deal with them, even what language you speak affords you immense opportunities, what country you were born in affords you immense opportunities, and where you were born in that country's hierarchy. All those things are inextricable from just all the hierarchies and inequalities of yesterday. And and then we should say, and that, that 400 years, I mean, that that is a... a that speaks to the durability of these structures um, in, in terms of going forward. You have, um, you know, similar, at least analogous in some respects when it comes to to gender and to um, uh, sexual orientation that may or may not be as um, uh, durable in some respects um because of you know the, it's it's nuanced in that way but it, the you know but the dynamic is similar in terms of these things carrying forward i think only recently did we just have a supreme court ruling 
uh, that impacted the ability, I think it was, uh, of employers to fire uh, someone because they're gay. I mean, mm. just that was their own, and that was uh, that, that's maybe months old, if if anything. Um, all right, so be that as may. So we and and then on the um, what, when we talk about the critique from the um, uh, the left, as it were, in terms of, or what you would say is a a bit of a caricature, but the class reductionist. Um, uh, so um, we're we're talking about people essentially saying the priority should be class in when assessing this. And sometimes uh, what is problematic with that is that it's not just priority, but it seems to sort of like completely eliminate another dynamic that may be at play, even if it emanates from the same capitalist uh, structure uh, that exists. All right, so with that sort of, you know, somewhat remedial, but, but I think it's important everybody's on the same page uh, on all these things. Um, um, you are closest to that, uh, that, that uh, what you call the class reductionist uh, critique, but, but how is it different from that critique? So one of the main differences is just the thing that you were kind of gesturing towards at the end there. So, so it's, it's one thing to say that there's a particular importance that class um, and labor and the kinds of things that are most squarely built into capitalism um, have in challenging the world. Um, and it's another thing to say that those should take kind of exclusive focus or even primary focus in terms of challenging how our social structures work. Um, over the years and decades that followed the Second World War, a lot of the biggest changes to the world structure, politically and economically speaking, were won by nationalist movements. Many of these were led by people who were exclusive, who were um, very you know, serious Marxist Leninists, but some of them weren't. Um, and it just turns out that, you know, what you need to get people together to move and to fight for one another may be different from, you know, what a social scientist would use to explain um, how it is that they will succeed or fail or, you know, what particular variable it is, you know, whatever it is that people are responding to politically, um, if it is aligned with justice or even potentially aligned with justice, seems like something that should be taken seriously. Um, let's uh, uh, speak about your the, the what you call deference politics as we as we move forward and 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 sort of um, discuss how sort of the original concept of identity politics you feel has been hijacked on some level. But um, what what is deference politics? Um, so there's a closely related kind of way of thinking or genre of thought to identity politics, and that's something people call standpoint epistemology. And it basically just means it's not just that who you are and where you stand in society um, should be a place that you start from in figuring out your political agenda, but also when we're thinking about knowledge, who knows things, who has insight into how things work, we should also pay attention to that. And standpoint epistemology, that thought that where you are affects what you know, I think is just right. Um, but there's, there's the question from there, how do you put that into practice? What do you do with that realization? And what some people have done is just say, well, what I'm going to do is defer, right? In general, I'm going to find a person who is of the right kind of social position, the right kind of oppressed group, um, who, or may, maybe who has the right kind of social experiences and whatever that person's political judgment is, is going to become my political judgment. And I think the motivation behind that is a good one, but I think that's um, the kind of way of sifting through politics that is very easy to game by power structures. And if we just think about how our power structures work, it would be extremely unlikely that they wouldn't kind of distort that kind of process. Who are rich people going to put on TV? Whose books, whose ideas are they going to circulate? Are they going to be the ones 
that genuinely challenge the status quo or are they going to be the ones that more often than not reflect interests that they have or at least are compatible with interests that they have um that's the more likely option i think and so we can't be sure that the particular oppressed person's opinion that we're getting is really representative and even if we could be sure of that that just isn't the question that we should be asking when it comes to knowledge what is the world like what should we do that's not about who's talking but that's about the world that's about what we're trying to accomplish okay and so um did did deference politics develop distinct from its being uh, employed by uh, uh, the elite, and I want to get we'll get into d defining the elite in a moment. But did it did it develop distinct from uh, its um, its uh, I guess um, uh, be, being used by the elite? I, I mean, how was that sequenced? I mean, because if I hear uh, if I understand this correctly, it's basically a turnkey way of for the elite. To sort of uh, shift where the topic is going to head, it's a it's a one stop shop on some level for 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 redirecting what might be um, other uh, issues in society on some level. And but what what was the sequencing of that? I mean, did deference politics just simply develop out of a uh, a sense of of folks who were not maybe marginalized, feeling like this is the best that we can do. Uh, I mean, and then it was sort of hijacked on some level or, or, or was it, did it happen simultaneously? I think the first thing to say is just, these are all old questions. You know, how do we know things, which kind of people are in the right kind of position to know? Um, so the terms that we used to describe them might be new, but these kind of, problems and challenges are always, you know, coming in and out of focus as years go by and as societies go through stages of development. Um, as far as and, the and last- I'm sorry, can I just clarify that? So this, on some yeah. level, this could be uh, analogous to an appeal to authority, except yeah. for in, in the context of deference politics, the problem is that the authority may be dubious in terms of what it really speaks for um, and, and whether it's representative and uh, I mean, so that's that's part of the issue there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and as far as you know, the things that have developed since this term identity politics uh, came on the scene in the seventies, um, I think it's I think it's been happening at the same time. So there's a lot of intellectual movements. There's a lot of political movements that are thinking about what to do with knowledge and what to do with authority. And they're all acting at the same time. Some of them are going to be people who are for principled reasons thinking, no, we need to change how we do science. We need to change how we do policies. And we need to make those changes in ways that genuinely affirm that the people who are affected by the science and the policies know things and our current scientific practices fail to reflect that. Right. So there are people who are pushing that line and there were other people who were, you know, on the HR committees of various mega corporations who said, you know, if we hire somebody like this and if we put this kind of person in the, you know, commercial for our product and so on and so forth, who had these, you know, less principled, um, more opportunistic ways of thinking about the contribution that identity makes, they were pushing a different line. And over time, which are people going to get more exposed to? Well, the people in group number two have way more resources, money, political reach, social reach than all the people in group number one. And so over time, more and more of our exposure to any version of this thought about identity or standpoint is going to look like what people in group number two are doing. Now, you know, some people are going to look at that and say, well, that is proof that there was never any radical potential of this thought. That's proof that this is co-optable. Um, but from where I sit, that's just proof that identity politics is like everything else. 
in a society that is structured to allow the people with the most money, resources, and social position the best opportunity to develop anything that they choose to develop. So uh, we're we're looking at multiple variants of let's say uh, of 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 this idea of identity politics, and um, because we live in a society that is dictated by where 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 capitalists have the power, um, it it essentially has there's a sort of a natural selection uh, that's taking place of some yes. sorts, and so the variant that is most um, suited uh, or suitable for the capitalist class, as it were, essentially the elites, as you describe them, um, that's the one that is going to uh, succeed in society, or at least, I guess, survive or, uh, yes. you know, or replicate, if you will, um, to use my sort of uh, this analogy. Um, so let's talk about who the elites are. Are we talking about... I mean, you, you say HR, you say corporations. Um, are we just basically talking about the capitalist class or, uh, or, or is, there another, is there another way to define the elites? Yeah, I mean, you could say the capitalist class plus. Um, you know, I think the basic thing that I'm trying to point out is that there are different kinds of domains of social life. Um, the domains of production, um, domain of the military, where maybe some generals of strong militaries are at the top of that chain, the domain of the media, where maybe, you know, Fox News types are at the top. You know, not all the people at the top of these hierarchies are going to be people who are capitalists. Um, but what characterizes all of them is that they are disproportionately in a position to affect how that sphere of life goes. And they can convert their power at that sphere of life to other spheres of life. Five-star generals are very rich. They get onto corporate boards and so on and so forth. They have political pull. Um, politicians are very rich, so on and so forth, right? So um, there's a at the top of these hierarchies, there's a kind of um, coming together of the people who have power. Um, not every kind of relevant social power in this discussion is the particular power of ownership over the means of production on a private basis, um, but they're relevant to deciding how these social questions go of how we think about particular concepts like identity politics and how those things get discussed would uh would some would 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 some of the capitalist critiques say like you know, well those people were in those positions basically as products of a capitalist system regardless of their stat their their specific status within the, the sort of uh, you know um uh, owning the means of production but rather they were put there as sort of like um they exist there because they don't in any way um, threaten that structure that exists. I mean, is that relevant at all? The, the, uh, that, that, or, or, or? It's true. Um, but, you know, if we believe, you know, if those of us who are on, you know, the Marxist side of things believe what we say about capitalism, it's also the things, it's also the system that puts everybody else in the positions they're in. All right, so it's so it's not enough to erase the difference between a capitalist and a four-star general or you know a media conglomerate uh, executive decision maker or something. Um, but it is you know if the point is just that capitalism is fundamentally explanatory, then that's true. Okay, and so um, let's uh, so what do we do? So if the elite have sort of um, have taken control, as it were, or have manipulated the idea of identity politics and have turned it into that, um, that <clears throat> or have promoted that variant, which basically says on some level, like, we're going to use this as a shield to uh, avoid addressing sort of some of the structural problems. Um, what what uh, what are we to do? What what are the rest of us to do uh, about that? 
I mean, what is the and, and you, you you get into like essentially, you know, um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I would call it solutions, but a way to address this because you you are I mean, you are not advocating getting rid or ignoring the idea of identity politics. Right. I mean, this is and I just want to maybe you, you can uh, uh, clarify that and then take us into, the you know, what we should be doing with it. Yeah, so I'm not advocating for getting rid of identity politics. I think the question isn't whether or not we use identity politics, but the question is how, to what ends do we um, put identity politics, which is the same political question we should ask of any idea that we're using politically. Um, and, you know, this is where my thinking is perhaps, you know, more most orthodox as far as, you know, maybe Marxist thought goes, but you, you basically want to build up the kinds of institutions that actually challenge the power gap between non-elites and elites, if you want to fight elite capture, and more importantly, if you want to actually change the way that the world works. Um, so rather than fighting with capitalists over the definition of identity politics and what real identity politics is, why don't we create the kinds of groups and linkages that can fight with capitalists over the terms of working conditions? Right? Those are unions. Um, I I'm, have a slightly broader view of this. You know, I think we should be fighting um, about decommodifying water and energy. I think those are also big um, centers of power for particular segments of the capitalist class, and we should want those to be genuinely publicly owned. Um, so decommodification, unions, um, but any kinds of changes that we can make that genuinely make a practical difference to how wide the gap is between elites and non-elites and not an ideological difference. Um, that's more or less the takeaway that I hope people take from the book. Well, I mean, uh, uh, can you tease that out on some level? So where what do we do with identity politics in that instance? Because, I mean, I think, you know, well, we can espouse the decommodification of, of you know, energy and water and maybe healthcare and housing. Uh, I mean, uh, we could throw that in and that would have and we don't even need to uh, t speak to identity politics. Yeah, we don't need to to explain why those are good things to do. We may need to to get people to do it. All right. So. You know, we're sitting here two years from the summer of 2020, in which a historically unprecedented number of people in the US and across the world, you know, went out and essentially fought to say, you know, we oppose racism. We oppose racism of the particular kind that was on display in the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and so many other people, right? That is a level of support and a level of interest and a level of political energy that doesn't exist for any of the other things that we mentioned, as far as I'm aware. And so those of us who understand the contribution that capitalism makes to the systems that killed George Floyd and Breonna Taylor would be better off saying what contributions it made rather than telling people they're wrong for thinking racism is an important thing to be against, right? People who understand what contribution capitalism makes to um, the gendered provision of healthcare would be better off saying in support of people who are fighting for abortion access and for healthcare and gender justice, saying in support of those movements, we support this and we understand, we have a particular understanding of what capitalism has to do with this thing. And we would ask you to support that understanding as well. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is, you know, there, there should be um, we should be positioning 
ourselves as with rather than against these kinds of currents that are way ahead of us political energy wise. So, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think to like, let's say like a Bernie Sanders race um, in, in 2016 and in 2020 to some extent, but particularly 2016, um, where I think his argument would have been something like um, uh, Medicare for all, for instance, or um, is going to um, provide for the most marginalized in society and, uh, and uh, you know, greater than, you know, uh, any type of, you know, uh, I guess, understanding about uh, racial disparities, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and he was criticized for being, I guess, a class reductionist on some level. Like, uh, you know, people would cite that uh, I can be a black man driving a Mercedes making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year, still get pulled over by the cops. Like where does like so and, and you talk about um, uh, constructive politics uh, in, in the book, like where like how would how would that application like how would you deal with that sort of disparity of perspective on what he's offering? So I think I think it was just, you know, it was just right to say that Medicare for all would address serious racial inequities, serious gender inequities, so on and so forth. Right. That was that was just correct. I think what we're up against is a kind of political culture that has for a variety of reasons, but the left hasn't done itself any favors um, on this issue, but for a variety of reasons, people pitch these against each other, right? So Medicare for all is something you would support instead of supporting something anti-racist, as opposed to being an anti-racist thing that you support. Um, and w part of taking back identity politics um, or trying to assert a version of identity politics that is not at odds with actually solving racism or patriarchy or any of these other things um, would be, I think, for people in both kinds of camps, the... Um, maybe class-centered and maybe other things centered um, political camps to start making it more obvious that those are things that are aligned. And I, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't seem to be obvious to people when Bernie ran those years ago, though I imagine if that happened today, things would be at least slightly different. I, I would imagine too, but 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 isn't there a at the very least on the side of people there is there is at least a significant portion of people who don't want to see that relationship, like the you know like I mean obviously it's the elite you know as you yeah. describe them but you know they've done a good job of selling that idea down the line and they have a, a, a far greater sort of access to promulgating that view right um i mean that's the the point like how how do and and i think on some level there was an attempt by some and, and i'm just using this as an example because it's the most sort of like obvious i guess real world example we have to promote that idea that th this is that medicare for all is a um it is anti-racist on some level and is um and is anti-transphobic uh one could argue and uh and uh anti-misogynist i mean we're I mean, we're just have had years it feels like over the past five or six years to sort of uh manifest that um but what is i, I mean is it is it you just you're you uh, as a as a coalition you're just trying to sort of pick off those people who are who have are uh 
who are not trying to weaponize the sort of bastardization of identity politics, but rather are maybe uh, open to it? I mean, is it is it really just a dispositional um, uh, approach that needs to change? It's not just a dispositional approach that needs to change. I think it's also, you know, a practical approach that needs to change. Um, so um, one of the one of the points that I've talked about elsewhere, there was a piece that I wrote with a colleague, Enzo Rossi, um, and, and we were talking about this kind of targeted universalism, right? Where you don't just say, well, it's Medicare for all and trans people are part of all, and so they're going to get Medicare, right? What, what you say is, here's how specifically groups of people that are targeted and stigmatized are going to be part of this vision that we're rolling out. And so we don't just include them as a grammatical default, but there is, but the universalism we're interested in is one that responds to specific people's circumstances and doesn't homogenize them. Right. I think that's the kind of universalism that we need to apply in general. And unions have historically been some of the institutions that have done this most effectively, where we are in a union and we are all bargaining for a contract and we all want a wage increase, um, but we are also bargaining together for specific sexual harassment policies, for instance, so that people who are targeted by harassment um, aren't targeted by harassment. That's not something that necessarily everybody in the union worries about, but as a union, we are bargaining for this particular demand. And so, you know, we often portray these particular kinds of problems that marginalized groups have as if they are incompatible with pushing for things for all, um, but that's not necessarily the case. Um extend this, I mean, and I know that you do, but um, uh, for the sake of just this conversation too, this principle uh, of, 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 of a way of approaching universalist uh, policies uh, also extends internationally. Will you, will you, will you talk about that, uh, that extension or really, it's not really an extension. I mean, it's just part of the same dynamic. Yeah, I think that's right. It's part of the same dynamic. And, you know, also, again, solidarity between groups across borders has often taken this form, um, whether we're talking about the transnational organizing in different unions across the world against apartheid in South Africa, whether we're talking about um, unions collaborating against war production, refusing to build missiles in Italy or refusing to unload them off docks in California in order to prevent them from being dropped somewhere else in the world, right? These are all things that we can have the disposition to execute, but we actually need the organization, the groups of people who are willing to do actions together in order to make any of those dispositions real challenges to the elites who want to build missiles and ship them across the world or enforce apartheid in South Africa or whatever it may be. Um, and so I guess, uh, lastly, what, how to respond to the sort of like the, 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 the cultural complaints? Um, I mean, you know, I, uh, sitting here, so much of what I read, particularly from like, I guess it, you know, I, I, the 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 right is far more, uh, uh, um, it seems to me, um, obvious their critique of 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 uh, identity politics, as it were, just because they, you know, they're mad that they're they're being displaced on some level. Um, but for that that center that talks about, you know. There are speech codes at Oberlin or something, you know, and and this is uh, and uh, I'm going to write my 15th column uh, in the New York Times about this. And uh, I mean, like what 
how to, is there, I mean, is, is there even, is it worth even engaging at that level or is it simply a, the engagement in and of itself is a distraction from the actual work that needs to take place to further a, a coalition? Yeah, I go back and forth on this one. You know, I think at the end of the day, the good thing about working at scale, you know, working with a lot of people, trying to get a lot of people involved, trying to do mass politics, is that you can't afford to really walk and chew gum. You know, if somebody has it in them to try to convince people that cancel culture isn't the biggest threat to humanity. It actually, maybe it's ecological collapse. Um, you know, more power to them. Uh, I don't think I have that in me myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very tired. I have other things to do. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it, it's just a question of focus at movement level. Right. So, so do we see these culture war battles um, of the chattering class as kind of primary and, and not just do we consciously see them as primary, but do we find ourselves constantly in reaction to what's happening at that level of discourse in those channels? Or do we have the social, political, and emotional discipline to keep our eye on the ball. Um, and if we have that, then there's space to have those fights while we're also trying to decommodify water and energy, while we're also trying to fight back against evictions, while we're also trying to get health care to everybody. What well, What is the relationship between the fact that, I mean, I, I, I guess, I, I mean, I may have been exaggerating with the 15 columns thing, but uh, I mean, what is the relationship between the elites who, you know, I think if you, if you uh, hand out who gets column space in the New York times or in any, uh, you know, major publication or, or television, I mean, what you are uh, definitionally elite, I think. Mm -hmm. um, what is the relationship between that and the sort of the critique of because cancel culture is sort of the flip side of of um i guess you know white fragility on some level right i mean uh, they're both working the same coin on some level um what is what what is the value to the elite of that of of basically putting i don't know both both teams on the pitch, as it were. I I really think it's distraction more than anything else. You know, th that's not to say that the people who are writing those columns don't believe themselves. You know, right. if, they, if they didn't believe themselves a little bit, it would be hard to go past column 11. You know, I would imagine. And, I know yeah. I'm quite convinced that they believe it, I, but but yeah. they're not the ones who hire themselves. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not that conspiratorial in general, but I really think, you know, with the cancel culture debate in general, uh, I I really just find that to be an astonishing achievement by the U.S. elite. <laughs> like breathtaking achievement, you know, in the context of our total impunity culture, which is in fact what is operating at the elite level. You know, I'm not even talking about the scores of, I'm not even talking about Epstein. I'm not even talking about the scores of harassment and assault allegations against so many elite people who um, are getting this message out. But even at the level of straight up war crimes, you know, there were there was invasions launched in Iraq and Afghanistan for reasons nobody even pretends to remember, much less defend. Uh, and there have been no consequences whatsoever for this. 
So, you know, if the elites have been able to get us thinking about our culture of responsibility and to center that discussion on whether or not the cafeteria is serving the right kind of food at some random college, that is an unbelievable, that is a world historical achievement by the elite class of today. Yeah, on the I back. I, I agree with you. It's it's pretty impressive uh, that they have been able to sort of the idea of cancel culture being a, uh, a, a anything of a significant uh, problem in our society as we look around, and it's uh, been a hundred degrees out for for, <laughs> for four weeks, and uh, there's wars. Uh, I mean, it 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 is fascinating. Um, it's uh, 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 really appreciate uh, your work and, and your coming on. Uh, and we will put a link to Elite Capture, How the Powerful Took Over Identity Politics and Everything Else uh, at majority.fm. Uh, Olafemi uh, Taiwo, Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University, thanks so much for coming on. Really do appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, folks. Going to head into uh, the fun half now. Uh, as we said, Emma is on um, mandatory leave. We canceled her. Yeah, I mean, it's just like the flu. She should be working. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want her to come in she with the flu. She's just fear-mongered by Fauci. Totally. That's why she's not here today doing work. That's right. Like the uh, Chicago teachers. <laughs> um, Folks, a, a reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only uh, get the free show free of commercials, but you help the show survive and thrive. Jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Uh, these guys... Like our, our pals at Sunset Lake Sabade, um, are our movement partners. They well, first off, they're the oldest sponsor on this program. Uh, Just Coffee was sponsoring uh, Marin and I when we were at Air America on uh, Break Room Live. And then, like Marin changed their business, uh, but then I mildly helped their business. But nevertheless, they do have a majority report blend. They are a co-op. Uh, when you talk about internationalism and support, uh, they really support their uh, farmers and their producers, uh, particularly in uh, Latin America, but I think they also have relationships uh, with um, some growers, I think in Ethiopia. I'm not 100% sure about that, but check out all their stuff. Get 10% off with the coupon code MAJORITY. Uh, Matt, what is happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, so uh, tomorrow night on Left Reckon, we're going to have Brian Muir on to talk about Lula and Bolsonaro and the upcoming elections and if uh, Lula is going to get, uh, if they're going to try some other shenanigans to uh, uh, stop Lula from taking uh, the presidency. Um, also, leftreckoning.com slash store, everybody's buying hats and tank tops and shirts are just flying off the shelves. Uh, go check that stuff out. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna uh, cop a hat probably today. I can't people wait. are really liking the. Hats. I was gonna say, so you know, uh, some people will bring them into the office and uh, hand around the office. You know, the, the hats. I, 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 uh, I well, you know. <laughs> um, I, I have a hat. I, I thought about wearing it. The only problem I have is like, I do want to wear the tank top and the hat, but I also feel like a a basketball player wearing their own jersey <laughs> when you wear your own stuff. Well, you know, you could also give it to the people That's in the true. office. I mean, so uh, complimentary. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's promotional, professional courtesy. <laughs> see, I think we see if we can find. I actually, one. when I was in college, uh, John Benjamin and I and another buddy uh, were. It, we came down to Manhattan. I don't know what we were doing here. I think maybe Benjamin uh, spent a semester at, at school here, and um, we're walking down the street. And this is just after Letterman moved his morning show. Letterman's show originally was a morning show. I don't know if you guys know that. Did and not know that. It was a, originally it was a morning show. And they moved it to uh, whatever it was, 11 or 11.30 at night. And at that time, um, 
uh, Chris Elliott was on the show. He was like playing the, the man who lived under the bleachers, under the seats, and he had a different. And so uh, Benjamin and I and our uh, other friend were walking down. I don't know where we were. I, wanna, I feel like near Central Park, but I'm not sure. And this dude starts, is walking towards us. Letterman headband, Letterman wristbands. You know those like sweatbands? Letterman jacket. Letterman hat, maybe, or maybe just the headband. A David Letterman Letterman jacket. A David Letterman. You're right, like a literal, like a, yeah, letter, yeah. Like right. a Letterman Letterman yeah. jacket. <laughs> and as we come close, we realize, oh my God, that's Chris Elliott. Like he's it was wearing, him. Yeah, it was he was wearing him. all of the stuff. And he walks by us, and we're just like, hey, Chris. And he looks back and goes, hey, guys. I mentioned that story to him. I ended up working with him on the show. He was a guest star on the show. And it was, uh, that's a whole nother story. But, he's amazing. Uh, he's really yes. incredibly funny. And uh, he had no recollection of that. But, um, or he pretended he didn't. But I spent a little time with him. It was, it was fun watching him drink a bunch of uh, bottled uh, uh, screwdrivers. <laughs> All right. We're going to head into the uh, fun half. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Matt! Yo. Fun hack. What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No me key. You did it! Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking. No. 